Please welcome this evening's guest moderator from IndieWire, Eric Cohn, and tonight's guest, Pat Healy. Thank you. It's a real mustache, I hear. Yeah, I, I'm special. told you're supposed to tug on it just to, to authenticate it. You want to? No, but other people can line up all later. Right, we'll, right. we'll figure it out. Amy wants to come up here. I don't want to do all the fun stuff. Took me a full year to grow it. <laughs> so this movie is insane uh, in great ways, only mildly hinted at in this trailer, and, and we'll show some yeah. other sneak peeks in the clips. Um, but, you know, if you were to describe it to somebody, a couple of guys basically just doing all this crazy stuff for money, it would be hard to envision it as a movie. Right. So what was that process like for you when you first kind of heard what it was about? I mean, I, I read the script and, uh, you know, knew the basic premise of it. And it's hard because it is difficult in, in, from a marketing standpoint to market it. Is it a genre film? Is it a horror film? Is it a dark comedy? Is it a, a drama? Is it a thriller? I mean, it's sort of all those things, and it's also something completely different, too. Uh, the exciting thing for me was to do something I hadn't seen quite before in this way and play a part that I'd never been offered before, which is, like, begins really sweet and innocently <laughs> and... and, and it's like sort of like the characters I've played before where I'm very repressed, and, but in this one, it, it, the, the balloon gets popped and I just get the, the, to like let it all go and let it all out. So um, I was interested in, there's a big audience for you know, genre fair, like this kind of stuff, like, but you know, horror and these kinds of cult films, but you don't really know quite what to call it. At the same time, I think the people that are seeing it as it's catching on, since it's been out for a week now, um, you know, are, are seeing, the, are liking the originality of it, you know, and are sitting in the audience and they're, uh, it's a real audience movie. If you can see it with a theater, in a theater with an audience, it's like people are so loud you can't hear the movie. So, like, that's something I didn't expect from this kind of movie. Um, did I totally not answer your question? It's it's a start. I guess what, what what I'm wondering is when you read this screenplay, yeah. you know, I mean, there there are parts of it where you know we're not spoiling too much to say there, there's bloody moments, there's yeah. some sexual depravity going yeah. on. You know, at what point were you kind of like, you know, okay, this is a crazy movie, but it's the kind of crazy that I can work with. I mean, I'm I think I'm so sick that I don't even kind of see that anymore. <laughs> like, I, I, it doesn't it doesn't seem that crazy to me. It certainly didn't seem as. Um, it's certainly more depraved and crazy than compliance, but it didn't seem as dark as compliance. Of course, you're not seeing a lot of that stuff. You're reading it. So when you see it, it's, it's pretty depraved. I just thought it was such a great part, and I thought, like, you know, this is a really great arc, and all the characters have great arcs, and the story is a great arc. It starts in one place and ends up in a completely different place. That I thought, like, I don't know that it gave much consideration to having to do those things. I actually like doing really challenging things because things that I think may, not that I want to shock people or I'm out to, to do something that's you know, necessarily prov provocative, but when I was growing up and really into movies and into cult movies, like these were the kind of movies I really sought out, whether it was Repo Man or Blue Velvet or Reservoir Dogs or you know, movies like that that really like, seemed like they were made just for me or my cult of friends. And I've sort of viewed it as that sort of movie, which it's, it's kind of turning out to be. Uh, and those movies are often crazy and they're often violent and they're often anti-authoritarian, author, author, anti you know, yes, I assume. Gesundheit. Um, you know, and sort of like anti-establishment movies. And uh, I certainly related to that aspect of it. And I sort of didn't give consideration to the fact that maybe people would think less of it because it's a, a horror movie or it's gory or, or, or anything like that. I just sort of thought, well, people will see that it's a good movie, which it, it, it started on the festival route as being, you know, a genre movie and being a midnight movie and being, you know, reviewed by those press outlets. But now it's sort of broadened out to, to you know, all kinds of different kinds of people liking the movie, including people that I, I've brought that would never like this kind of movie that, that love it, you know, even though it's, you know, they don't like the gore or that that's not really like their kind of thing, but they get into the characters and the story. So I guess that's how I always, I guess I always look past that other stuff. Well, let's touch on that. This, setting aside the fact that, yeah, it is sort of a horror film in certain parts. You know, your character is this blue collar guy who loses his job 
and all of a sudden gets this amazing opportunity to get rich quick. Amazing, so, in air quotes, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, the semantics, I guess. I mean, right. Demented opportunity might be another way of putting yeah. it. But what was your way into kind of the struggles that this guy was going through? Well, I certainly have struggles of those of my own. I mean, financially, I'm not stable. I'm, you know, I'm, I have a career as a screenwriter, which affords me to do movies like this where I don't make a lot of money, but... The roles that I've been most recognized for are these smaller movies where that, that, that don't pay a lot. So I, I certainly understand on the financial um, end of it, and I certainly relate to that financial aspect of it on the grander scheme of things of what's going on in our country and in the world right now and all that. Personally speaking, I thought that there was a lot to be said about uh, male ego, and at some point money almost becomes uh, immaterial. <laughs> Uh, no pun intended, and it really just becomes about a, a, a kind of, you know, a pissing contest for for lack of a better phrase, and this, you know, competition about who's better and who's more masculine. And I think also the idea that does tie in with money is uh, the loss of the male ego uh, as regards women becoming breadwinners and men maybe not becoming the breadwinners as as much, which is not a thing that bothers me at all, but I know is a thing that bothers a lot of men. And, you know, uh, I think both in this and Breaking Bad, I think is a good analogy, too. Like, the character's pride doesn't allow them to ask for help or take the help that's offered to them by their wives or their friends and things like that. And they, they do, you know, they resort to desperate measures in order to, to get things done. I, I, I understood that. I also understood someone who... I don't think somebody wakes up one day and all of a sudden does all kinds of crazy things. There's, there's got to be something inside them from the beginning. And so if you look at, like, the characters very sort of repressed at the beginning, and a lot of the characters that I've played, you see that, and you kind of sort of see it underneath the surface, but it never comes out. I just knew... I shot the beginning and the end of the movie at the, f at the beginning of the movie, and I knew where I started and where I ended up, and, you know, without giving anything away, there's a big difference. And uh, I just had to sort of chart from here to there where he was going to let each part come out until devolves or evolves into this craziness that you see in the movie. So you mentioned the desperate measures. We have a clip that's from one of the earlier parts of those stages that takes place in the, in the bathroom. Do you want to set that up a little bit for us? Here? Yeah, there's a, so there's a, I play a, a father who's uh, of a newborn who's married, who loses his job. He's a writer, a wannabe writer, but he has a job as an auto mechanic. He loses his job, he runs into an old friend that Ethan Embry plays, who's become like a low rent debt collector guy. He's like, he's hard on money too. And then we meet this couple played by uh, David Koechner and Sarah Paxton, who I did Innkeepers with. And uh, they have a lot of money and they start offering us monies for, uh, money for certain dares, like slap that waitress's ass or do a shot and things like that. And then, um, is that the scene we're gonna see, the first one? Or, yeah. So we meet in a bar and then we meet uh, this couple and this sort of contest that uh, slowly devolves over the night begins. I think that's what this is. Let's take a look. Let's hear it. So there you go. If, if you think that's funny, then it gets much better. And that sort of starts off very innocently and fun. And that same game continues throughout the movie, but to much... Darker Plus the and deeper swear degrees. words add so much to it. <laughs> yeah, that's true. You have to use your You can figure out what there. the words were, I'm sure. You're so David Koechner is a comedian who's known for, you know, doing a lot of broad comedy, yeah. uh, which, I, you know, it's interesting to see him take this on where it's kind of, he's kind of funny in the movie, but he's also kind of a lunatic. So Yeah, he's using that it? charm that he has that you're familiar with to, just like he lures us in the movie in with, with the David Koechner funny guy. And then you know turns on the the the, the evil, uh, sort of like one of those like great character actor turns like uh, Pat Hingle and the Grifters or Wilford Brimley, you know, who was like the oatmeal salesman on TV, but in the firm he's like the assassin. He's like, I'm gonna kill you and your whole family. He's like the the grandpa from Cocoon. But here we see you know David use what he does well, you know, to lure you in with that, and then you know drop the hammer. This sinister uh, character, you know. It seems all really funny there, and everyone really laughs in that beginning part of the movie, and then he gets pretty uh, sick and terrifying. So for you guys, as things got more sick and terrifying for the characters, was, did that make the movie more fun? or was No, it, I mean, less. It was I mean, it was really interesting because uh, I wasn't trying to do a method thing, I, and I don't think I, Ethan was either, but we did not get along. 
Uh, we really went after each other, and I, I didn't know what was going on. And I, I think at the time I thought it was him, and I blamed a lot on him. I, I realize now I, I probably had my own attitude about feeling that I was better than him, and there was genuine competition. We were also shooting. We shot the whole movie in 14 days, and 11 of those days are in that house, which is the most of the movie, and it was 105 degrees outside. The air conditioning was broken. It was intense. It was a first-time director. It was two cameras. It was like we were shooting 10, 11, 12 pages a day. It got to all of us, and it was hard. So when we were actually acting, it was really fun. But, you know, any other time, just things just seemed like they were going to fall apart, and tapes got lost. You know, there's a really important scene in the movie, a big dramatic scene that I have that was really difficult to do emotionally and physically, and it got erased accidentally, and I had to do it again two days later. I mean... So when we see you in the later scenes of this movie and you look like you're ready to it's, kill somebody... It's all really kind of happening. I mean, I don't, I don't know how else you could do a movie like this with that amount of time, with so little time. Like, for example, the shortest amount of time I've ever had on an independent film is 18 days. That's really cutting it close. This was 14 days, so, like, it was insane. I, I, I you know... I, I don't know how we did it, but at the same time, I feel like if we hadn't done that, maybe it wouldn't be as good as it is. Like when you see uh, Apocalypse Now, the Hearts of Darkness documentary, or uh, Burden of Dreams, the documentary about Fitzcarraldo, like those are movies on much bigger scales where that happened. This is sort of like the microcosmic version of that happening in this house in Silver Lake in LA, you know, of just everyone just going crazy. And there's actually a really great. I think it's a 40 minute making of you might be able to get it in this bit torrent bundle that's out now but i know it's on the dvd of the making of it where this guy tj nordiker who's a friend of ours filmed every single thing that happened and you see a lot of the stuff go down and it's pretty crazy and gives you a good idea of like sort of having to live the part and live the movie you know in order to get it done in that that, that quick period of time you know Right, well, we have another clip, so maybe mm. with this context, we can we can look a little bit closer at what was going on, you know. Yeah. So 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 between when you saw me the last time, and when you see me this time, I got punched in the face really hard with my glasses on, and I wake up in this weird house with these people, and uh, it's just kind of weird what's going on, and there's some more pranks that happen, and I get upset, and I go into the bathroom because. Uh, somebody just did something horrible to me and I have to clean myself up. And uh, Ethan joins me in there and he, he tells me about uh, a plan that he's going to hatch to sort of turn the tables on these people whose house we're in. Let's look. So for those of you who worry about that being a spoiler, believe me, that's really early on in the evening still. <laughs> it gets much worse. All the spoilers happen outside of the Yeah, bathroom. yeah. We actually thought about having him come out with bloody tissues in his nose, but the mustache made it difficult. Yeah, I so. did the whole movie. Uh, well, the majority of the movie I did with two tissues stuffed up my nose because I, I get my face broken really early in the movie, much like Jack Nicholson in Chinatown. <laughs> and uh, I have a tissue, a bloody tissue sticking out of one end, but I thought to be realistic about it, I had to plug the other one up because it would have to sound, my voice takes on a completely different quality if my nose is broken. So I actually couldn't breathe out of my nose for the, for, for the majority of the movie either, which you, you kind of hear this different quality to my voice there. But uh, uh, that was interesting, especially when you couldn't really like breathe that much in there anyway. Didn't help the mood. Yeah. Um, well, it's interesting to look at this clip and, and sort of see why you would want to do this kind of project. I mean, there's some really intense acting going on there. The camera's close in on you. Your eyes are bulging out. You look like a train hit you, you know? And for those who don't know, I mean, Pat's been kind of like one of indie films, I'd say, best kept secrets, except oh, that thanks. people have seen these movies that you've been in for the last six or seven years. Movies like Great World of Sound, uh, Compliance, Ty West's film, The Innkeepers, you mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. um, really kind of these interesting, fragile, kind of almost, well, with the exception of Compliance, I would say kind of goofy to some extent, uh -huh. but also like with a, a darker Even side. Even Compliance, the character has some goofiness to right. him. Yeah. You, you know, have to he's, he's imagine Satan. some of it. Yeah, yeah the goofy sadist of sorts. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, there's an interesting range for the, the kinds of characters that you seem drawn to. Um, and I would, I would say this kind of brings you full circle to, to Great World of Sound in yeah. some ways, you know, both kind of these low-income guys struggling to bring home the bacon of sorts. 
Um, so, you know, what what is sort of the game plan for you as an actor in, in, in that respect? I mean, there are some people who would just kind of take every role that comes their way, and certainly I'm sure you've had opportunities to do other kinds of bigger projects. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm drawn to things where I think, I, I mean, this isn't something that I've thought about from the beginning, but in thinking about it recently, having watched this movie so much, and we showed Great World of Sound again in L.A. a couple of weeks ago and did a QA and a for that, that these characters who are flawed and somehow we're humanizing them even the guy in compliance somehow to even if you just you don't have to like them just to understand who they are i think that's really interesting to me i think this character in particular uh goes from a to z it was the first time i really had a role where i could go from a to z and do every single thing i've ever wanted to do in my entire career in one movie really i mean i really get to do everything in this movie Every, you know, gamut, you know, I run the entire gamut of emotions, you know, every action, you know, every cool thing you want to do in a movie, you know, showing parts of myself that it's really important for me to show parts of myself that are, I'm vulnerable about and that are, that are scary for me to show, that I'm afraid to show people. Like, I, it's important for me as a person and as an actor and an artist to, to show those to people because I, I grow as a person in doing that. So... I got to do all that with this movie, and I thought it was also really going to be really viscerally exciting, too. And it really is, you know, a leading man part, even though it's a weird leading man. I mean, even though it's, he's an anti-hero in a lot of ways, he is the hero of this movie. So there were great ways that, I mean, I think you'll, when you see the movie, you'll agree it's one of the best endings ever, and I won't give it away. But it, there's a way that it, you know, plays with the idea of the hero of the movie that's just like, really fascinating that people like really sticks with people that they love and w that really stuck with me when I read it and when we shot it and everything so I think things like that it's important for me to do to to learn and grow but it's I don't know I like I want people to see it you know and I want people to see me do it and as far as other bigger things it's like I made a lot of money for a long time just working small parts in big movies guest stars on tv shows and I just felt like I wasn't achieving the career that I wanted to have and I felt like I wasn't creatively satisfied and I have this career as a screenwriter I, I make money writing and that afforded me to stop you know that was about uh, seven years ago to stop going out for everything and going out for this pilot season and all these things that happen in LA that really don't ultimately do a lot for me except kind of crush my spirit a little and because I was making money with the screenwriting, I could say to Craig Zobel, or I could say to Ty West, or, or to, to Evan Katz here, yeah, I can take the time and go and do this for a month and not worry about paying my rent, because I've got my rent covered, you know, and go and do these things. And now suddenly people have taken notice, as you've said, these are small films, but people are seeing them, whether they see them in, in the theater or they see them on Netflix or whatever. Um, I'm allowed to be a leading man in a movie, which is like, you know, Evan really wanted to cast me in this because he loved Great World of Sound, which is a movie a lot, a lot of people saw. But the producers were concerned financially, and then Compliance came out, and uh, it did really well, you know, for, especially for a movie like that. And the weekend after it came out, they offered me the part. So it's slowly building on it. I don't know what the plan is. I, I, I hope that I keep continuing to do interesting roles no, of, no matter what size and whatever kind of movie, big or small. I just want to continue to do this. You know, uh, I love acting. So. And let's be clear, you are still getting it both ways because you have a tiny role, my understanding is, in the new Captain America movie. Yeah, that's, that's right, I do, out, so. yeah. Which is funny because this movie's coming out first and now everyone's like, oh, great cameo by Pat Healy in the movie. But, I mean, the truth is my, my friends, the Russo brothers, uh, who I developed a script with many years ago, asked me if just called me up and said, do you want to come and work with Robert Redford for a day? And I said, yeah, sure, of course. Uh, but I, and I have a, one scene in that, and I have this great scene in um, this movie Draft Day with Kevin Costner that Ivan Reitman directed, and he's like a huge childhood uh, hero of mine because he directed Ghostbusters and Stripes and Meatballs and all these movies that were really important to me when I was growing up. So, uh, And that's a very good movie, which I just saw. I haven't seen Captain America yet, but I heard it's really good. So I... I there were lots of things that came out of, you know, like they asked me to do, be the villain on Eagle Heart, you know, the Adult Swim show with Chris Elliott last season because they loved compliance. And it's starting to pay off, you know. I, I mean, I, I like that it's happening for me a little later in my life because I'm certain if I, this happened to me when I was in my 20s or even my early 30s, I, I would have become a total monster because I, I wouldn't have learned enough about myself. But I really had to, like, work hard and sort of earn 
to be here. And, and who knows, this may all end on a poof of smoke, you know, after this movie's done, but it seems to be building. I mean, we found out that Mr. Tarantino uh, showed up at the screening last night just because he heard about it and showed up at the theater and people like that are seeing the movie. So it's like, it's definitely the word of mouth is getting out in this day and age when it's really hard to like get a movie just by word of mouth to be a hit other than spending a lot of ad dollars. This movie really seems to be getting some traction. So, Right. And now you're sane enough to be able to deal with that, as you said. Yeah, I feel stable now. You know, like I, right before Christmas, I went in an audition for this HBO series that uh, Terrence Winter wrote, who created Boardwalk Empire, and Martin Scorsese is directing the pilot. And I met his casting director, Ellen Lewis. And for me, Martin Scorsese is the pinnacle of everything. I, that's the person that I most want to work with. And I was just going in for an audition with Ellen. I'd never met her. I sat down. As I was leaning down into my seat, she said, Marty wanted me to tell you how much he loves The Innkeepers. He watches it over and over again. And I, I'm not ashamed to tell you that I literally just started crying right in front of her. It meant everything to me. So. It's like little things like that are starting to happen where it's just like I could never imagine, you know, this little movie that we did that basically people are discovering on Netflix that someone like that is, you know, he sees everything he's discovering and he likes it. And that, you know, I do need to make a living and make money and, and, and you know, I want to make this my job that I make a living at. But getting one of those is a huge shot in the arm, I'll, I'll tell you, because that's, that's like, you know. It's like your dad telling you how proud he is of you when you're a little kid or something. You know, it's, it's a big deal. Your cinematic father. Of yeah. Uh, I want to open this up to Q&A. Uh, I want to warn people that I've read reports of, of other Q&As here that have led to debauchery similar to that in the movie. I don't think we can fulfill oh, yeah. quite those levels. It's something in the, We've the done these dares in front of audiences in Austin. Like a guy had cheap thrills tattooed on his buttock. Uh, we had a, a kid dip his testicles in a bowl of sriracha sauce. And they, they often didn't know, even know what the prizes were, or, and they hadn't seen the film yet. That's Austin, Texas. But then in Los Angeles, we did Tim Lee, who runs uh, Alamo Draft House, and Draft House is releasing this film, uh, does this thing called Extreme Tequila Shots, where you snort a line of salt, do the tequila shot, and squirt the lime in your eye. He wanted me to do that at the screenings here this weekend, and I told him I wasn't going to do it. So, questions? Hi, thank you for coming out to speak with us today. Thanks. Um, so, I have a million questions that I would like to ask you based on all of this, but I am just going to ask one. Um, the clip in which they're discussing the, the robbery and the plan, um, the beat work in that is extremely impressive um, and as a, a developing actor myself I find that moment to moment to be extremely challenging um, and you know you talked about the heat and the stress and the pressure do you have any specific tools or, or ways to stay that actively present and, and to keep in that moment to have that authentic response at all? Yeah, I mean, I've, I studied acting for, you know, a long time. I mean, starting when I was a little kid, but, you know, realistically speaking, when I started college in the late 80s, early 90s, and uh, through an internship at Steppenwolf Theater uh, in Chicago, and, um, and then I worked for a really long time now with this great teacher in L.A. named Joan Shekel, and you said beat work, and that's really important because what you do is you you pick a defining action for your character throughout the film, so maybe this is like to win, you know? It's a simple act action verb. And then within each scene, there is a goal for that whole scene, and then within that there are beat changes, as you said. So a lot of actors are really interested in um, what they call authenticity or what they call realistic acting, and that's fine. It, it usually means a lot of like, mumbling or changing the words in the script to make it sound more palatable, but it doesn't necessarily make it interesting. I think if you see the really great actors, if, whether it's Marlon Brando or Meryl Streep or Robert De Niro or Daniel Day-Lewis, they are both extremely present and realistic characters, but also larger than life. It has to be cinematic, it has to be theatrical. So, you know, what Joan sort of teaches is that you want to be really present, you want to be choose active verbs. In other words, you can't play an emotion. You can't say, I'm going to be sad here. I mean, can anyone evoke tears? No, you have to like 
do something, whether it's the action is thinking about somebody you care about or something in order to evoke that emotion. And if you've done your homework, which I do a lot of the preparation at home so that when I show up, I don't take up a lot of time, especially in something with a short schedule like this, and a lot of daydreaming, and a lot of script analysis with you say, like breaking down the beats of each, each, the whole script, each scene, and then each beat within the scene, so that when I show up, I can just play. So if you have a situation like this, you always have that center, that core of where you're coming from, and then anything that can be thrown at you, you are the best word about acting vulnerable to whatever comes at you. You're going to react in an authentic way because you're really going to be in that moment. It's not about, I'm gonna pretend that I'm that person or I believe that I'm my person. That, of course that happens because your imagination is really active, but it's about you know just trusting that it'll come if you've done the work and you've chosen the right things. Even if you have to switch it up and you feel it's not working or whatever, you'll be able to come. If the director says, I want to do that, but can you laugh or make it funny? You still come from the same place. It's just you're metabolizing the information for based on the character, the core, you know, sort of like character that you came up with. And, um, and you have to be really um, resilient and really, I mean, I had to like start running twice as much every day. I run three miles a day. I had to start running six miles every day. I had to drink a gallon of water every day. I had to not drink any al alcohol. I had to watch my diet. Not because I wanted to look good in the movie, but because it was like an endurance test. I knew it was going to be difficult. And I, I didn't want to get sick, and I didn't want to get mentally you know, or emotionally unfocused So, because there, there was enough that was being thrown at me. So all those things are things I'm, you know, that, are, that are important. Um, but uh, that is really important, what you talked about. It's like you just have to do that homework really hard and make choices, even if they may be the wrong choices, if they're interesting, if they'll be good, you know, and, and show up and stick to that. And if things change, just know that you can switch it up as long as you know who you are and where you're coming from. Hey, how you doing, Pat? Hey, good. Uh, so one of my favorite uh, short films, actually uh, short film, uh, independent films is Hard Candy. Yes. And I know a lot of people know about this and it's a really small cast, shot less than 30 days. And you talked about how you had to shoot this in 14. Now, a lot of those people in those films have went on to do other things like X-Men, Ellen Page, great films. Yeah, Patrick Wilson and Patrick uh, Wilson. Uh, um, uh, Ellen Page. Yeah, yeah. and uh, even like The Colorist was on 28 Days Later. You know, right, like, yeah. So uh, amazing yeah, things yeah, Slade, in yeah, such right, small yeah. time. Yeah. Um, would you say that actually shooting in a smaller schedule helps you become a better actor versus like being on a, um, a set for like maybe 30, 40, maybe to like longer than that? I think so. I think, I mean, you know, you don't always want to do it because it's very trying and it doesn't pay very well. So you can't do this all the time, I think. You know, if you were a marathon runner, you couldn't run one every day, you know. Um, but it, it forces a creativity because you don't have resources to just sort of sit around and think about it or, or money to throw at the problem. You really have to like be, you know, like I was saying to you, like, you know, you have to be like ready for, for everything at any moment. And there are things that happened in this movie that really surprised all of us when they happened. Even though there was a script that we stuck pretty closely to, it's like when you say something to someone and they react in a certain way and it makes you react in a different way, those are things you don't necessarily come up with, um, you know, if you have too much room to think about. I'm, I'm sure I would do the same amount of work if I were to have a role like this in a bigger movie, and probably at my life would be a little bit more comfortable, you know, but um, I think there is something about that that really causes you to be more creative, and, and, and certainly you have to think faster, and you're, you know, it's like if you're in an emergency situation, you know, you always like figure out what to do or you can lift the car up off the baby or whatever, like that kind of thing happens in these sort of situations. So I like it, but I, I don't know. I couldn't do it all the time, you know. Hey, Pat. Hey. Um, I've been trying to think about a good way to word this, so forgive me. But I was Is creepy part of it? No, not <laughs> okay, creepy good. at all. Uh, earlier on, you mentioned about uh, thinking about like marketability and stuff mm -hmm. early on, and I'm wondering like... As you're, as you're getting offered roles or searching for roles, how much of that affects your decision making on what kinds of jobs you're going to take or not take? You know, how much of it is still f fun during the process? Like, how much do you let that affect all your decision making for what you're going to do with your craft? It's a really difficult thing to manage because, you know, 
at the end of the day, I, I ultimately, I mean, I know the business very well. I mean, I had a subscription to Variety when I was 12 years old. I'm that kind of weirdo. And so I know the business well, but you just don't know. And I think early on in my career, when I was coming out of acting school and I wanted to be Marlon Brando or Robert De Niro, that, that handsome, dark, brooding actor, and I wasn't. I was like trying to make it in Hollywood and get these big jobs that other actors were doing in I think who I was was kind of like working against that. And once I started to, it was like this. I was thought of as a character actor. I mean, I think, I guess I still am. And Joan, my teacher, you know, actually was the one who said to me, you know, I think you're a leading man. Like right around the time that Craig and uh, David Green had asked me to do Great World of Sound. And um, I decided to stop acting like a leading man and just accept me and started being in that movie in particular. I really am just a lot of who I really am. And as soon as I stopped trying to act like a leading man or whatever, I became a leading man by doing character roles. And to like, you know, to, to, to further it, like Compliance was a movie I had reservations about doing because I was afraid that it would be a career killer for me. Not because I didn't think it was a good movie, but because the role was very unlikable, the movie was very challenging, and I thought, this is going to kill me, and it's been the best boon to my career. You know, I even... Craig Zobel even thought he might not use me in the film and just use my voice, you know. Um, he decided ultimately not to do that. But it could have really been hard. So I think the real answer to your question is the only real measure is to be true to yourself, to be really in touch with your feelings and know what that is and know what it is that you want to achieve and do that. It's not a guarantee, but I think that if you do that and you work harder than you think you need to work, which I, you know, I found out later in life, but has really worked out for me, then that's your best bet, you know? I think if you're trying to think about what people want or marketing or things like that, it, it just doesn't work that way. It only worked for me once I l let go of any ideas of that and just really focused on the work and made it all about the work and the least likely things ended up being giant career boons for me. And then personally and professionally, really richly rewarding experiences on, on top of that, so. I mean, I would just add to what you were saying while people are thinking of their questions that, uh, you know, the movies that you're talking about, they're, they're not traditional leading man roles, not right. just in terms of topic, but, uh, you know, in terms of physical challenge. In Great World of Sound, you're, you were acting with real people. Sometimes they didn't even know they were in a movie. Right. And you, you have know. to be really good then because they can't know that you're acting because you're sitting this close to them and they think you're a real person. But, I mean, you know, non-traditional leading men, I love the movies of the 70s. I love all... Gene Hackman and Jack Nicholson and, uh, you know, Dustin Hoffman and even De Niro and Pacino, even though they're like great looking guys, they're not traditional leading men. Those, those were the people I grew up with. I mean, Walter Matthau and Jack Lemmon were leading men when I was growing up, you know, like, and I feel like we've lost that a little bit. We had it with, uh, you know, my friend Phil Hoffman, bless his soul, and, you know, uh, Sam Rockwell and a little bit and Richard Jenkins to a certain degree are those guys that have stepped out and, 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 you know, into leading men roles and can do both. But, like, we don't have it as much. And I, I would really like to be that because I, I like a non-traditional leading man. I think people like to see those characters, too. And I think more movies at these lower budget level levels are able to, 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 you know, make decisions like that, whereas you might not be able to have a character like that in a bigger movie. Hello, Pat. Hi. Uh, so I have a question about, have you ever had those days where things get, really emotionally hard and you start to second guess the decisions that you've made and maybe things aren't going so well and you start to say should I be working towards this or that uh, what do you say to get yourself out of that do you have like a mantra or some kind of brother thing that I've you had always... years like that I'm not kidding <laughs> there was two whole years of my life in my early 30s where I did not work I, wor I was out of work for an entire year I had a, one job I got fired from, and then I was out of work for a whole other year. On top of that, everything else that happens in your life, relationships, money, life pressures and things. I, um, you know, again, not ashamed to say I've, I've been in psychoanalysis for a long time. It's really helped me out a lot. But I would say that just looking at the example of my life, every time something has gotten really bad, it gets better. And when it gets better again, it's better than it was before things got bad. Without exception, that's been true. If you just hang in there, and I know it sounds simple or simplistic, but 
if you just hang in there, as I have, I've been out in LA for 16 years and it's really only starting to happen for me now, you know, and sometimes I'm barely able to make a living. It'll, it'll happen for you. You know, things just always get better and just, just hang in there. And a friend of mine always says, uh, always go further. Like if you're on a, on the freeway or the highway and you feel like you missed your exit, he says, always go further. You never missed it. You didn't miss it. It's still coming. And I, that, that lesson is true in that case, but it's analogous to life, you know, like just keep going. It'll be all right, if you keep going, if you stop, you'll stop yourself. And, you know, like I said, there are no guarantees, but I, I think also that's your best bet, you know. I've also written a lot of blogs. If you'd like to do a, you know, search for my Tumblr and stuff, like I've written about depression and anxiety and things that I've dealt with because I've had, you know, friends commit suicide or die or, you know, worse and things. And, and I've written to people because I know there's people out there who suffer and especially doing what we do, it's, it's hard, even for successful people doing this. So... If you ever look up those, uh, people tend to find those really inspirational and write to me all the time and say thank you for those. So, you know, take, look for those because sometimes I, I write better than I speak. And the movie is actually a good illustration of some of these ideas. When you, when I, I, I think so. Them. I think, you know, a lot of the things I've done are, anal all the movies I've done are analogous to things in my life that I believe in. And maybe I chose them unconsciously, but you know, they're, they're all things that represent me in some way and say what I want to say. And... That's another great thing about these independent films is you get a sort of uh, ownership over it. They give you, you get at least a partial authorship of it, you know, uh, being an actor, which you don't always get on a bigger movie. So, so uh, it's one thing to talk about this movie. It's something else to go see it. You should. It opens in New York this week. It's also on iTunes right now. Tell your friends. And then you get your tattoo at the end. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Pat. Thanks. Thank Thanks, you, Eric. Guys. Thanks, guys.